Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, present an award that is a special uh, special award agreed upon by the Organizing Committee of ECC 2010 to Professor Scott Vanstone. As uh, I indicated in my talk at one point, uh, Scott's a very unusual mathematician. He's both made major contributions to basic mathematics in discrete mathematics, a theory of uh, finite fields and other areas, and at the same time, he's a very practical person. He has good instincts, unlike some of us. And, and uh, has been a leading force not only in the mathematics of elliptic curve cryptography, but uh, more surprisingly, perhaps, in on the commercial side and in the whole difficult process of standardization. So let me just uh, read the inscription on this award that I'm going to present. Uh, it's the special ECC 2010 award presented to Scott A. Vanstone for seminal contributions to research, development, standardization, and commercialization of elliptic curve cryptography. Well, thank you. This is a wonderful honor. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for bestowing this upon me. I'll certainly hang it in a very prominent place. I've got a few remarks. I'd like to make a short trip down memory lane, so I hopefully won't keep you too long because I need a glass of wine. So everybody who's been around from the very beginning of ECC, I noticed when they started their talks today, they said, it's hard to believe it's been 25 years. And I'm the same. It really is hard to believe all that time's gone by, and we've had a lot of fun doing it. I've learned over the years that when an idea is right, it is often the case that is conceived by more than one person. ECC is a prime example of this phenomena. Neil Koblitz and Victor Miller, working independently, discovered ECC at essentially the same time in 1985. I attended the crypto conference in Santa Barbara, California for many, many years. I was president of Victor Miller's talk at Crypto 85 when he presented his paper in ECC. I'll return to this monumental event a bit later in my comments. I was educated as a combinatorial mathematician specializing in the theory of designs. This area required a comprehensive knowledge of finite fields, finite geometries, and algebra. At the expense of fend offending some, I've never found a serious application for combinatorial designs. So I'm glad I moved on. Anyhow, I had the right background to move into public key cryptography. A major turning, a major turning point for me was the appearance of a preprint of the RSA paper, a method for obtaining digital signatures and public key crypto systems. Paper appeared in 1978, but the preprint circulated at least a year earlier. I found this article fascinating and a great example as to how elementary number theory could have a practical application. I co-authored the first year algebra book at the University of Waterloo. This book and course consisted of subjects such as greatest common divisor, Euclidean algorithm, the extended Euclidean algorithm, modular arithmetic, finite fields, etc. I enjoyed teaching the course, but it lacked any real world application. RSA was the answer to this problem. I immediately wrote a new chapter which introduced cryptography and the RSA algorithm. Approximately six weeks into the course, the first year students had enough background they could understand the algorithm and why it worked. This course is still taught at Waterloo where approximately 1,500 mathematics majors per year take it. At this stage, I definitely had a keen interest in cryptography. In 1979, I was doing some contract work for the Communications Research Center in Ottawa. 
I did this work so that I could fund one of my postdoctoral students and one that uh, Victor mentioned this morning, Ryo Fujihara. He's the one that told Don Coppersmith what we were doing. I've forgiven him already, but... <laughs> At first, the project appeared to have nothing to do with cryptography. But as we learned more, it became clear that a solution to the CRC project we were given was essentially to find an algorithm to take the street logarithms in a binary field. A quick check of the literature revealed that a number of organizations were implementing Diffie-Hellman key exchanges in the multiplicative group of a binary finite field. And Victor, of course, mentioned that this morning also. Eula Packard was producing a chip to implement arithmetic in the finite field with two to the 127 elements. At this point in time, the best people could do was to take logarithms in a field with two to the 32 elements. And it was believed that two to the 127 was completely infeasible. We developed an algorithm that would compute logarithms in two to the 127 by making use of the extended Euclidean algorithm. We implemented this algorithm and forced people to abandon binary fields of this size for public key purposes. Later on, as Victor mentioned, Don Coppersmith, who's now at IDA, improved our algorithm and could find logs in, in a field with two to the 27 elements in a matter of seconds or minutes. What we learned from this work was that if we wanted to use binary fields in cryptography, we needed to build devices that could compute efficiently in much larger binary fields. <clears throat> it was unclear in the early 80s how one could do this. <clears throat> Further research revealed that normal bases with certain properties could work. We discovered optimal normal bases and a circuit architecture to implement them. The mathematics behind these bases was certainly elegant <clears throat> and the subject of numerous research papers by many people, including Henrik Lenstra. <clears throat> optimal normal bases is a problem that would not have even been defined had it not been for the fact we needed, uh, we needed to build something and we needed new mathematics to do it. We embarked on building a chip to do arithmetic in the finite field with two of the 593 elements. <coughs> this field has an optimal normal basis. Based on this work, we started Certicom in 1985. Originally, we called the company Cryptech. Three professors. Cryptic. Until we heard from many people, they thought we were in the mortuary business. <laughs> <coughs> so Cryptech became Mobius Encryption Technologies, and finally Certicom in 1995 when the company went public. This chip was used in PC encryptors and a fax encryptor Certicom developed. This technology kept the company going through the late 80s and early 90s. <coughs> Okay, let's now return to ECC. As I mentioned earlier, I heard Victor speak about the potential of ECC in 1985. Coincidentally, this was the same year that we started Certicom, and many people believe to this day that Certicom was started because of ECC. This is incorrect. It was started to do Diffie-Hellman in the multiplicative group of a finite field. Victor started his presentation at Crypto 85 by saying that if you had built a chip to do arithmetic, in a finite field with two to the 127 elements, don't throw it away. It may be useful for elliptic curve cryptography. This was interesting and perked my interest considerably. I left the lecture hall that day saying to myself that if this crypto system is secure, it's technologically superior to anything out there. Returning to Waterloo, I embarked on a research program to both study the security of ECC and how to best implement it. Certicom was not promoting it nor implementing it in these early days. The security of ECC was a huge unknown, and I would not have bet the farm on this technology at such an early stage. From 85 until 93, my students and I studied the security. <coughs> it was during this period that we found the Menezes Okamoto Vanstone attack, now referred to as MOV, which showed that super singular curves should be avoided. In 1993, it became clear to me that Certicom was a Me Too company. We had an interesting technology, but the key sizes of the original technology were about the same size as RSA keys. 
and we only had a small speed advantage over RSA. In short, there was no compelling reason for anyone to move from RSA to our system. By 93, 1993, eight years after its discovery, I was becoming more confident with the security of ECC, and I decided that CERTICOM should promote the technology. This we did through evangelizing it and aggressively pursuing its standardization. We started this process six or seven years before anyone else had faith in the technology. <coughs> Given that we started promoting ECC in 1993, CERTICOM did not produce a software product based on ECC until 1997, 12 years after the discovery of ECC. The first standard, including ECC, started in January 1994, was IEEE 1363, Part A. The standard was not officially approved until 2000. ECC is now in every major standard around the world, I'm pleased to say. Spring of 1997, I was approached by Demetrius Markakis of Mondex International. Mondex was a consortium of banks in the UK. They, uh, they were producing a payment system using RSA and a smart card. Mondex liked the efficiency of ECC, but felt that it required global scrutiny. In order to increase the visibility of ECC, Mondex asked me to start a workshop on elliptic curve cryptography. And they agreed to fund the first <coughs> workshop for the fund the workshop for three years. The first three were at Waterloo, and then we moved the next one to Essen, I believe. So now we're at number 14 and going strong. At the first workshop in November 1997, CERTICOM introduced a challenge similar to the RSA challenge. Challenge was developed to increase industry understanding and appreciation for the difficulty of the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem and to encourage and stimulate further research in the security analysis of elliptic curve crypto systems. The challenge consisted of three levels, exercises, mid-range, and commercially deployed ECC implementations. I did not wish to implement this challenge, as I thought that the problem was far too difficult. However, Alfred Menezes convinced me otherwise and introduced the idea of the exercises. The exercises were challenging but doable, and it took approximately seven years for the exercises to all be solved. In 1998, I invited Joseph Silverman to speak at the ECC workshop. Joseph agreed to speak, and a month before the workshop, he called me to tell me that he had found a new approach, the Zendi calculus, which is, of course, index spelled backwards to take discrete logarithms on elliptic curves. Well, that moment is when I was pretty convinced that my commercial venture was going down the tubes. It, fortunately, though, Neil Koblitz was on sabbatical at the University of Waterloo. He and four postdoctoral fellows of mine began extensive study of the Zendi calculus. Although Silverman's idea was extremely clever, three months of work by Neil and the postdocs showed that this approach is less efficient than exhaustive search. ECC had weathered a serious storm. A significant milestone and a huge endorsement for ECC technology <coughs> came in October 2003 when the NSA licensed 26 of CERTICOM's patents. In February 2005 at the RSA conference in San Francisco, the NSA announced their sweet B. This was the first time that the NSA had endorsed a suite of cryptographic algorithms. The public key portion of the algorithms is exclusively elliptic curve cryptography. Now ECC is implemented in devices that we use every day, such as it's in TVs. Virtually every flat screen TV out there has ECC in it. It's in Blu-ray players, it's in smart meters, even in some automobiles. CERTICOM was uh, acquired about a year and a half ago by the BlackBerry folks. And this device, this is running the highest strength in this curve over a prime field. It's running 521 bits of elliptic curve. There's more security in this than the US government requires for classified information. And it all works well. We can do sweet B on this, but uh, by just changing the key size. 
So anyhow, ECC is here to stay, and I'm, I'm honored and I'm proud to have been a part of this history. I hope it continues. It's been a wonderful ride, and I can't thank uh, the organizing committee for bestowing this great honor upon me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. So now we're going, the next item of business is the rump session, and so Dan Bernstein will take over for that. Thanks. We have a few talks lined up, but the first and most important part of a rump session is alcohol. Now, I think not everybody has noticed that there are free drinks outside that way. I think most people notice the food over here, but there's drinks over there. So we're going to spend the next 15 minutes, that's until 7.10, exploring the drink options out there, and then come back and we're actually going to have some talks set up on the computer here. So see you at 7.10. Okay, welcome to the second part of the rump session. For the next 20 minutes, we're happy to have as an invited rump session presentation a fight between Neil Koblitz and Shafi Goldwasser on the merits of provable <laughs> security. <laughs> Where are they? Where are the speakers? Uh, <laughs> oh no, in this corner. Okay, uh, since the invited speakers don't seem to be coming up, we'll move on to the next presentation by Gaetan Bisson, Romain Cosset, and Damien Robert on ABI Isogenies. Hi, everybody. So let's go forward. So, yeah, we're all the three of us be presenting a library we recently wrote that computes isogeny between a billion varieties. But first, a little bit of context. So, we come from the Caramel team uh, that most likely you all know as the Cacao team. And uh, as you can see, we, we like tasty things. And uh, I would like to yeah, present the people that come up with these silly jokes of using tasty things as a uh, group name. So here are the serious people of the team. Um, uh, half of them are here, and you'll see most probably all of them at ECC uh, 2011. And there are young people also in the team. Uh, so there's me, Romain here, and Damien. And there's also a hardware guy that is actually not concerned at all with this talk, so let's strike him out. <laughs> So when the serious people write a code, then uh, <laughs> so so when the serious people write code, uh, it gives this. So this is um, few few characters, and uh, it counts point and uh, Jacobian of a generous two curve. And yes, it works. It it even find bugs. Uh, <laughs> it find bugs in magma. Uh, sorry. And uh, it's, it, it, of course, it's reasonably fast. And it's a uh, logo of the team. So. <laughs> now, when we code, it looks more like that, uh, which if you look closely enough, you see that it does various things at various places. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> closer. <laughs> closer. <laughs> Come closer. And um, so, but this, yeah, the actually all this code you see here is not even a, a complete genius, uh, well, two or more SEI implementation. So it's slow. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it uses a lot of various really confusing structures. For instance, you have like 101 ways of representing theta null points and theta functions. <laughs> uh, then we also have our core formulas that are ugly and that we won't, you, you won't ever gonna be able to recompute by hand again. And uh, for computing torsion, for computing torsion, we use field extension, but in a very, very bad way. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, and there are a lot of redundant chunk of code everywhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, for your convenience, we split them over a <laughs> lot of files that are all gonna be loaded into Magma whenever you try to use the library. So just like the serious people, we like to obfuscate your code, so we use the inline function. And the documentation is in Frenglish, <laughs> or sometimes only in French for convenience. And finally, if you ever try to run this code, which we hope you won't, uh, well, you'll find many interesting bugs. Not all of us are in our package. Some are in Magma. So despite all that, if you have really a strong desire to compute as a genius, and a bit more than that, eventually, 
and some CPU cycles to waste, and even more important, some lots of brain cycles to waste, <laughs> then just drop us an email and we'll, you will get a LGPL library for free. Thanks. <laughs> I suppose we have time for questions, if there are any quick questions. <laughs> oh, shit. Rich. How do we get the other code? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the logo on the of the team, so you just need to. No, you, you just need a pen and a piece of paper, <laughs> and here you go. <laughs> David. I'm wondering, is Fringlish, is that the French word for franglais? <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it's just uh, the uh, 2.0 version of Esperanto. <laughs> okay, in the absence of further questions, let's thank the speaker again. Three speakers. Okay, coming up next, we have David Freeman, who is going to be telling us about homomorphic signatures for polynomial functions. So this is... So this, is, uh, this has very little to do with elliptic curve cryptography. Um, it uses a little bit of number theory, and apparently the rump session had some empty slots, so they let me <laughs> come here. Uh, and this is joint work with Dan Bonet. So a big thing in crypto recently has been homomorphic encryption, which lets you compute, uh, uh, apply functions to encrypted data. And what we do is look at applying functions to authenticated data. So what does that mean? We have Alice over here with her secret key. And she wants to send, so here Alice is a professor. She's uh, sending the grades in her class to some untrusted database. There are all the grades. And she, each with each grade, she puts some signature um, that indicates you know, the data, so the grade of 91. The student that has the data, so the u, the u sub i means which student, the i student and the fact that it belongs in this grades database. Then later, Bob comes along, and he's a student, and he knows what his grade is, and he wants to know how well he did in the class relative to everyone else. So he wants to know what the class average was. So he sends along the query mean, and the set of, you know, the, just the indices of all the students in the class. Um, and the database can uh, compute the mean, and also a signature that authenticates the mean, that says actually these are this is the average of of the grades that uh, Alice put into the database, and ideally the signature is going to be short, and it will also not let Bob you know reveal that uh, his girlfriend actually did better than him in the class. <laughs> so um, more generally, we talk we talk about f homomorphic signatures for some class of functions f. You just have some uh, data that's all signed with uh, some tag that ties it all together that just says this all came from the same set of data. Then for some, some uh, little f in this set of functions, uh, we can compute a signature on, on the function applied to all the data. So it's a multivariate function in, in the number of variables is the number of, of data entries. So what, well, what do we know how to do? So in the past, we know how to do linear functions on signed data. So we could compute the average. Uh, we can compute least squares fit, at least if the x coordinates were some public uh, parameter and, and the y was actually the data, because uh, that's only a linear, requires only a linear computation. Uh, we could do uh, Fourier transforms, Fourier coefficients. But for nonlinear functions, well, <coughs> until now we don't know anything, and nonlinear functions tend to be useful. We could do, with nonlinear functions, you can compute standard deviation. You can compute a least squares fit if both the x and y are variable. They have to be authenticated. Uh, other nonlinear estimators and also some tools from uh, data mining. So, so what we are able to do in this construction is we can do a signature scheme that authenticates multivariate polynomials applied to data, uh, where the degree the degree of the polynomial is, is low. Um, but even with quadratic functions, we can already compute standard deviation or least squares fits, uh, like a linear fit for a quadratic and you know, higher polynomial fits for not much higher degrees. So in one slide, I'll try to tell you how it works. Um, so 
in case you, uh, so use the uh, somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme of Gentry. There's also a paper by Smart and Verkauterin that explains uh, this in some more uh, number theoretic language. So the public key and the scheme are some prime ideals P and Q uh, in some number ring. And the secret key is some short basis for uh, the intersection and in which if they're both prime is just the product. Uh, and short depends on some embedding of the number ring into R to the N, so that's a detail I will leave for later. But basically, um, the data uh, uh, correspond to elements of O mod P, so this is just some finite field. Uh, functions correspond in some way that's determined by the tag uh, to elements of O mod Q, so some different finite field. And the signature that uh, authenticates a function applied to the data is an element in the ring that's the right thing mod p and mod q. So it's the, it's the thing you want to authenticate mod p, and it corresponds in this, in this well-defined way to the, to, the, to the right function mod q. So if you're given the signature, you can, you can verify that it actually authentic authenticates the data that is that function of the original set. And now since um, mod p and mod q are homomorphisms, uh, we see that if we add or multiply these signatures that are elements of, of a number ring, then we also add or multiply the data, um, and we can add or multiply functions as well. So for example, you can build a quadratic polynomial by multiplying two linear polynomials. Uh, so security, well, so basically uh, a forgery is if I can convince you that uh, if I, you know, give you a signature on some data and some function, and actually the data is not the right, that function applied to the original data set. Uh, and so we won't try to get into the provable security uh, argument, but we say under some specific model, uh, if you can forge a signature, then you can construct a short element um, in this ideal Q. And an interesting thing, and perhaps uh, the, the only relation to ECC is that uh, this is something that we can't appear to do with ECC. Uh, if you tried to work in a group of order P and a group of order Q in ECC, well, you have the Polig-Hellman uh, algorithm just, that just says work with them separately and you can, and you can uh, solve it, uh, whatever problem you're trying to do. But uh, in this case, because this shortness uses both mod P and mod Q parts, there's sort of no way to separate them. Um, so the hardness of the system, well, finding a short element of an ideal, for example, if it's a principal ideal, finding a short generator is a classical number theoretic problem. Uh, lattice basis reductions such as LLL don't seem to be good enough. Uh, they give something that's sort of exponentially too long. And we can also connect this with uh, some of the recent work of, of Gentry on, on worst case lattice problems. Questions? All right, All right, you're out of here. Let's thank the speaker again. All right, I think we have uh, only 25 more announcements lined up for you in the rump session. And after a short day like, oh, oops, I'm sorry. No, we only have one more announcement lined up for you. So the last uh, talk of the rump session will be by Peter Schwabe, who will tell you about the correct use of the negation map in the Pollard row method. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, yes, yeah, the subtitle of the talk says this is going to be an entirely boring and actually enforced talk. And it's joint work with uh, Dan Bernstein and Tanya Lange. Now you might ask, why is it a boring talk? Well, actually everything I'm going to tell you, you know already. And why is it enforced? Um, yeah, so the RUM session chairs, as you could see, are also the co-authors of that. The RUM session chairs are also my supervisors, and by the end of this week I have to submit my thesis. <laughs> now, Dan and Tanya want me to give this talk, so I think it would be very stupid to not do so. Um, yeah, so let me start to tell you something that you already know. Um, I think pretty much everybody here knows that for the hard elliptic curve uh, discrete logarithm problems that we usually encounter in elliptic curve cryptography, Paula Rowe's algorithm is the best method to solve those. And it uses a pseudo-random walk through the group G um, of points uh, with p i plus 1 is f of p i for some pseudo-random function f. And then when the walk collides, we can solve the ECDLP. That's the rough idea. And uh, the expected number of iterations is square root of pi times um, the group order of G half. Now, uh, um, 
pretty nice idea is if you define this walk, this f on uh, equivalence classes, modulo e efficiently computable endomorphisms, then um, this is becoming more efficient. And for elliptic curves, we have the negation, which is always um, quite efficiently computable. So uh, we can simply choose the smallest representatives, uh, representative modular negation, and we get a factor of square root of 2 speed up. And this is all very well known, as I said at the beginning, and it's textbook optimization, so it's very fine. Now, the current record for solving ECDLPs um, has been announced in July 2009. Um, it's a 112-bit ECDLP. Um, it has been announced by Boskai Hara, Lack, Kleinjung, Lenstra, and Montgomery. And this one used a cluster of 200 PlayStation 3 gaming consoles to solve this. And the interesting fact is that they did not use this square root of speed up from the negation map. Um, the reason is, well, if you have 200 PlayStation sitting around, you just don't care. <laughs> well, it would be a pretty good reason. I mean, I don't know what I would do if I had 200 PlayStation sitting around. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, I just made it up. So the reason they're giving is that they did not use the common negation map since it requires branching and results in code that runs slower in a SIMD environment. Now, SIMD is a way of computing that most modern microprocessors use, which stands for um, single instruction stream and multiple data stream. And, well, pretty much every mi microprocessor uses it. So apparently, if you want to solve um, ECDLPs nowadays, you don't use the negation app. That's pretty much what it says on any modern microprocessor. Why is that the case? Well, the, the common way to construct the iteration function f is that you pre-compute some points, say t0 to tk, um, and then you define a function h, which is a hash function from the group g to some, some index set from 0 to k, and then you define this function f as p plus, well, t h of p. So you just, in, in each iteration, you just add some point. And if you do that um, with the negation, then you end up in some fruitless cycle. So you have some, some point p, and then let's say that um, this hash function h just yields some i. So you add ti. And then you look at what the smallest one of this uh, of, of p plus ti and minus p plus ti is according to some definition of smallest. And then let's say it's minus. And then in the next, then you hash that again. And if you get again i as the value of the hash function, you add ti again. And you end up at p. And so you just circle around p and p plus or minus p plus ti. That's not a big problem. There are several techniques to resolve these fruitless cycles, but it's an apparently highly annoying uh, in a SIMD environment. Now, what, uh, the reason why I'm standing here um, oh, um, is that with, together with Tanya and Dan, we showed that annoying is not the same as impossible. So we come up with a new implementation which shows that you can actually use the negation map for exactly the same ECDLP. And it solves this ECDLP 1.8 times faster, expected, roughly. And this, this speed up by 1.8 comes from, well, the use of a negation map, which gives pretty much a factor of square root of 2, using a branchless computation. And the remaining, comes from, remaining factor of 1.3 comes from faster arithmetic. Um, the paper will be online very soon. Now, Dan, a few weeks ago, an announced that it's going to be online soon. So I think I should say that's very soon. I'm going to say that it's this week. At least I hope so. And um, yeah, so. The conclusion is that the use of negation map in Pollard's row algorithm um, actually speeds up the, the algorithm by a factor of square root of 2. And that's pretty much what you know, knew already before. Thank you anyways for your attention. All right, before we bring this to a close, um, let me remind you that things start tomorrow at the same time, ridiculously early in the morning that they started today. Despite that, you might want to stick around here for a while. I believe we have the continued use of this room until 9 o'clock, and then there's some buses for people staying over the homestead. So with that, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers again.